Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar hosted by Kinexus. I'm Mark Graven, a senior advisor with Kinexus. I'm really pleased that we have um, Evan Grasick and Bob Bell presenting today, um, a webinar titled Building a Better Way Every Day, The Value of Small Improvements. So I know they have uh, a lot to share, and I know it's going to be really interesting to our audience. So thank you, everybody, for being here um, across the globe. Again, very happy to be joined uh, by Evan and Bob. They'll, they'll tell you more about Woodfin and, and, and the company and, and the products and the different uh, businesses they're in. Uh, but Evan Grasick has a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from Clemson University. He has a Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt certification from Clemson. And previous roles and, and jobs that he's had include uh, being a lean process engineer at the Schaffler Group and a lean manufacturing engineer at Borg Warner. We're joined us also uh, by Bob Bell. He has a BBA in marketing from the University of Georgia, a PBC in information uh, technology from the University of Richmond, and an MBA from the UVA Darden School of Business. Bob earned his Six Sigma Greenbelt while working at Circuit City. So his background includes uh, retail, both operations and finance, information technology, inventory management, and financial planning and analysis. Um, so with that, um, welcome, Evan and Bob. I will turn it over to you. Great. So a little bit of background on Woodfin. Um, we're in Virginia and some of us are in North Carolina, and we kind of have a lot of different operations. Um, we've got a heating oil fuel delivery operation, convenience stores, every residential service you can come up with pretty much as far as plumbing, electrical, IEQ, HVAC. Um, we also do commercial HVAC and electrical work. And we even have a graphics and wrap shop. So uh, quite a diverse background. Uh, one thing, the metal fabrication, that's the vortex. We're also in kind of a manufacturing environment. So a lot of different environments going on. Um, Evan, you can switch. So with that, there's some challenges. So with these different business units, a lot of what we've run into is uh, these businesses have developed cultures over the last 30 years, and they're all fairly unique. Um, one of the advantages of our continuous improvement initiative is we actually have started to cross, I guess pollinate would be a word, but we're communicating a lot more across these business units and that's been great for us. So it's been a challenge, but it's also been a big benefit. Um, also geographically, we're pretty spread out. Um, which makes training uh, really being able to get present and in meetings, uh, it just makes it a little difficult, but I'm sure everybody has a little bit of geography. So the idea-driven organization, how did it all come about? So we had some of our key executives and the owners attended a small business event and uh, Dr. Alan Robinson spoke. He's uh, the author of the idea-driven organization and um, great book, recommend reading it if you get a chance. Um, but he kind of spoke to them and then they continued communicating with him. And in 2018, they started to kind of say, hey, we're gonna do this with us. And one of the things that really impressed them was the, the small problems or the foundation of a continuous improvement culture. And that really resonated, especially with as diverse as we are and trying to come up with uh, how, to, how to do continuous improvement. So spring of 2018, we started with uh, four pilot teams we had accounting, uh, we had a plumbing department, we had a manufacturing department. So we kind of spread it out to see what we would see and, and what changes we needed to make and whether we could be consistent. Um, in 2019, I came in as a director trying to get everything set up and really get the structure set up. Um, and the first priority really for us was controlling expectations and getting a manual out there and just giving a framework for people to work with. So. One of the things I learned really quickly is we have a lot of different business units, a lot of people with different levels of uh, communication, problem solving skills. So making it rigid or, you know, this is a exact path you want to follow really wouldn't fit for us. So we focused more on a general framework. I would call them baby bumpers on the bowling alley just to keep people kind of in the rails, but have them uh, find their own um, way of managing continuous improvement or own style. Um, so with that, our job was to make it easier for them to accomplish their goals, um, not tell them, hey, this is how you do it. So the three rules we kind of set up early were participate, be respectful, and try to find the best answer. If you're doing those three things, no matter what we do right or wrong, that's going to help you get where you need to go. 
And that's really the secret to the whole adventure. Um, last thing we really try to do, and again, it's an ongoing, try to improve it all the time, but we really try to listen to our participants and get feedback loops present so that we can kind of hear what they're experiencing um, and try to help give them the tools they need to overcome obstacles that jump up. So one of the other things we did is a vision statement. And I think if you, if you, I, I like the importance of a vision statement because it kind of tells me when I'm not on track. So this was our vision statement. I'm not going to read it to you, but the gist of it would be, we want a framework that sets you up to win and it makes you collaborate and you're doing it quickly and it's positive and with small ideas that quickly allows that to happen. Um, everybody participates. There is no, you don't have to have a black belt to be part of this. You know, you just need to want to make things better and you can participate. We also found that some people are a lot better at coming up with problems versus solving them. And some people are really good at solving problems. Some people were great at research. So everybody has a skill they can use. And then lastly, is a win, win, win. You have to look at something where the customers, the company and the employees are all winning. And if you can't come up with that, you need to think a little bit harder. That's what I used to say all the time. So we're always looking for a win, win, win. So getting up and running. So some of the stuff we found that was really useful up front was facilitator roundtables. They're kind of the, the center of this adventure. They're the ones who run the meetings and they're really good feedback loops. Um, you know, I wish we could spend a lot more time training. That's one of the things we'll talk about later, but uh, they really are kind of the, the, the glue that holds this together. Um, we try to do surveys to get feedback loops. Again, a lot of formal feedback. And then getting the meetings and being there um, and actually interacting with the teams as a peer, not as a, hey, listen to me, this is what you do, um, is really effective, we found. And so now we're going to talk about why small problems. So the thing that we found with small problems is, and my favorite part of the whole thing is everybody can participate. There are people that are working in the field every day that see things that management will never see. And those things are hurting productivity. And so at the end of the day, small ideas basically are saying, keep your eyes open, don't step over issues, bring the problem up. And in the old traditional sense of, I'm gonna hand it off to management to solve it, we don't really like that either. We want those people to solve those problems. And the key to that is really they're invested. They're going to experience the benefit. Once the thing is implemented, they really feel like, hey, I'm part of this and I set this up. And if I need to change it, hey, let's put it back on the board and work it again. So really getting everybody involved, everybody has a say. The thing that's beautiful about small problems is they're often solved quickly. Um, I think communication and getting to root cause early is something we stress and stress and we can't do enough of it and we'll continue to do it um, to really fix it for good. That's what we call the root cause, get to the root cause so, so you fix it once and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, they rarely require a large capital investment to solve it. It's not like you have to throw a lot of money at it. A lot of these things are process oriented, lack of training, things along those lines. So I think uh, when you're really focused on making my work today better than yesterday, um, you can usually solve those problems with how you're doing the tasks. Um, easily replicable, that's a word that we like to mispronounce a lot, but uh, what that means is with we have 66 to 70 departments. So one department might come up with an idea on how to save money. And what we're, we have a method in Kinexus for sharing all those implemented ideas that we think others would benefit from if five other departments can actually realize that and use it, that's replication, that's just adding up savings and they don't have to go through a lot of the legwork to figure out what the root cause was and what the problem was. So we find a lot of benefit. So we talked about everyone in the organization, organization can participate. And Alan Robinson actually mentioned the 100 headed brains. We'll, we'll talk about that real quick. And this is an interesting insight. So the 100 headed brain basically says as individuals, we have a certain amount of problems we can recognize, and we have a certain number of solutions we can come up with. And they don't always overlap. So my, the, the definition of an idea is a problem and a solution, or an opportunity and a solution, quite honestly. So with that, the average person given to their own devices has a small subset of things that they can actually identify the problem, come up with a solution. 
So the collaborative aspect of this and getting more people involved throughout the organization, you have much more experience or a breadth of experience. You have uh, knowledge bases, non-traditional knowledge bases from some people. All those people coming together, if you can see that problems bubble get bigger and bigger and bigger and solutions get bigger and bigger and bigger, when you combine people, it gives you much more capability to actually solve problems in your business. So again, getting everybody involved to me is the, the key to small problems. Um, I'll say one side note, um, in, in the continuous improvement space, we talk about top down, bottom up. And I think that a lot of initiatives and the Six Sigmas and the, the, the dedicated teams is one way to do it. But with innovation and this idea system, those are two of the bottom up ways that gets more, more involvement from everybody in the team. And we're really excited about continuing to grow that. We're fairly new. And I would say training is something that is definitely you need to focus on. A couple other real quick side notes. Um, one thing that really benefits us with small problems is they're working on things that are going to benefit them. And I think that's, that helps with buy-in a little bit. doesn't make it easy to get buy-in, but it does assist. Um, and that people are still doing their daily jobs. They actually aren't taking six months of their life and focusing on a project. They dedicate 30 minutes for a meeting, maybe 45 if they have a lot to talk about. And then one hour of what we call action items. Um, I'm not going to say homework because I know that, but I just did. Um, but really, it's an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes a week that they're spending trying to make their lives and the company better. And I think that's really beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, Bob, if I could just add a, a side note in there as well, something that I've noticed um, early on when I started to deliver the training and whatnot. Um, kind of going over the notion that problems, you know, are, are a good thing to, to bring up, a good thing to have, because as a, as a company, as an organization, if we refuse to acknowledge our problems, then we're never going to get better. We're never going to get over those problems. So kind of setting that tone early on really helps kind of set the preference as we move forward with the training and identify these opportunities in our teams. Yeah, and honestly, we called them idea boards, and we actually had uh, people putting tape up saying problem boards, just to say, hey, we acknowledge problems. And one of the things that's funny about that, Alan would talk about um, bankers coming in and looking at boards and being impressed that they were actually acknowledging their problems and working on it. And I think that was a good sell for some of our managers, too. You said, you know, hey, if you're acknowledging the problem and trying to make it better, you're doing what you need to be doing. So it's not it's not a weakness. Um, and I believe we have one more. And I, we kind of talked about this with the bottom up, top down. One of the things also that uh, I give credit to Alan for was uh, there are very few that actually you can actually test. But from his experience with it, what he was saying was that 80% of improvement, if you have the black belt, green belt projects, the BPM stuff, and then you have an idea system, in most businesses, 80% of the true improvement came through the idea systems. Um, and I just thought that was an impressive statistic. So a couple of quick examples, sorry, I'm going a little fast just so I don't give time for Q&A, but uh, some examples of small ideas that we did in, internally, these are not ground shaking, but we, had, we have a, a operating system that we run all our residential business units off of. And what would happen is we would have technicians driving around in the country trying to find uh, addresses because the GPS on the actual operating platform wasn't working. And this would happen more than you would think in Virginia. <laughs> and um, so they kind of put it on the board, came through, went to IT and our IT uh, director said, you know, hey, I can just turn the GPS on your phones. Easy fix, took maybe a minute of per phone. They could all do it themselves, gave it out. And that way they could put the address in their phones and get there. Um, again, stuff that people just stepped over before, really didn't pay a whole lot of attention to, probably complained about, but we brought it to the board and had an easy fix. Um, we had another thing, this is not the most pleasant topic, but it was a sewer machine, and that's basically a clean out machine. And what happened with our plumbing team is they couldn't find them. And then when they found them, they were broken. <laughs> it was like a mysterious vortex they would disappear into. And then when they came back out, they were broken. So. This is one of those, and you'll find with some of these smaller ideas that 
when you get to root cause, it might break into four or five different things um, that you actually can benefit from. So just a, a quick overview of, so they figured out that the big serum machine was only required about 20% of the time and also was bad on the back. So they got smaller machines and put them on the truck. Wouldn't take up as much room. They can get them off by themselves. They found out that, hey, we don't have them serialized. We have no way of tracking. So they actually put tags on them and actually kept the system in, in Slack to actually maintain where they are and who had them. And then they also set up replacement parts, inventory, and a maintenance schedule. So they're always fixed. And it doesn't sound like anything crazy, but during the spring when roots were growing, that was probably 20 hours a week that they were spending running around trying to find things, trying to fix things to my customers. Believe. So I think that's a, a very good example of what it can do for you. Yeah. And then I'll let you balance. Yeah, this, this one is my personal favorite. Uh, it's an example that Alan uses in the training that he gives us and that we now give to our employees. Um, but it happened at a bar. You know, a bartender had to take the recycling down one day and he realized that that takes him away from the bar. He can't serve drinks, customers are waiting. Um, and he's got to walk down, you know, lug a bunch of glass bottles and aluminum cans down these stairs into a dark, dank basement. So, you know, he was thinking about it. He looks up one day and he realizes I'm right under the bar right here. So maybe if we drill some holes in the floor, put some shoots down, we can, we can speed this process up. Um, and that's kind of good that he was able to suggest that and that the manager was able to hear him say, Hey, let's drill holes in the ground of the bar and not immediately discount him. You know, somebody's telling me to drill a hole in my office. I'm going to, I'm going to back it up and say, hang on. But he framed the, the problem. And then he came up with the solution. They refined it and, and got to this. And, you know, when they looked at some of the impacts that they got from it, not only did it save them a significant amount of time and increase their sales because he was able to man the bar, but it's, it reduced a safety hazard as well, lugging those heavy glass bottles down some stairs of well, who knows what condition. So, you know, all of this, all this being said, you know, focus on the small problems. There's a lot of concerns that comes with it. Um, with that, you know, by the definition that we have of small problems, you know, they, they usually have a little bit smaller impact, but we say they build up. Something that we ran into early on with our managers was them seeing the value in those small improvements. Okay, so yes, you may improve it in your area and it may add up in other areas, but for, for my area, was it really worth my time? Um, so something that we constantly work with our managers with, constantly work to keep the conversation open with and provide more methods to, to, to have visibility into the progress the team is making, um, just to show them the impact that their improvement has and to kind of take it beyond their immediate department and, and treat us as a whole, as an idea network across the organization. Um, going along the same manager route, uh, serving a mentor role as opposed to a manager role, that's kind of attacking the basic culture that we've been you know, accustomed to for the past 30 years, as Bob mentioned. Um, some of our managers you know, were brought up with that management style. You do as I say, um, and, and we're all happy. Now we're trying to help them out. We're trying to lead them to the solution without telling them the answers. And that's a skill that needs to be practiced and developed, something that even myself as an idea network director continues to, to work on personally. Um, so that's kind of the, the major concerns with the managers. Uh, they play a huge role in, in through you know, the process, the, the early on process, as well as the more recent uh, construction challenges that we're going to talk about next. Uh, that's, that's helped us really uh, identify the significance of the manager role in this whole thing. Um, at the idea team level, something we're seeing today with teams at all levels of experience. So teams that have been around since 2018, even teams that have been around you know, for the past two, three months. Um, going after huge, shiny ideas, you know, going for the glory um, and taking a while, getting stuck in the mud, you know, not showing any significant progress. They're still carrying out work and, and solving problems. But since their OFIs are so large, since their problems are so broad, we can't quantify their, their progress quite as well. Um, so that takes some constant reinforcement. Remember, we're taking it back to that small problem. And we really try to, to just reiterate the reasons why. Um, there's 
time and place for these larger scale projects, um, but we have project teams for that and we've set up support teams to help alleviate that. Um, something we can definitely talk about a little bit more. Um, something that Alan actually prepared us for in his training uh, early on um, was a lull. You know, people are gonna run out of ideas after a certain period of time. Since we've had teams in the process since 2018, we've had teams reaching this point over the past year. And that combined with COVID has caused its own slew of problems. Um, so we're at a point now where that's a major concern, bringing that next level of problem solving training and problem identification training on, online. Um, and you know, we're gonna kind of talk about here how we've got the idea network hierarchy set up to kind of support that for us. Um, the last two communication uh, within teams and across the organization, as well as training time and resources. Those are super critical uh, for everybody, something we constantly run against, uh, we get pushed back from. Um, but Kinexus, I can tell you, has been a huge uh, savior for us in the communication side, having so many different departments and so many different companies working on different things. Kinexus is that unifier that brings us together, puts everything in one core spot. Um, so over the over 2020, you know, we, we really were able to dive in there and get everybody on board, everybody in the system and everybody's ideas into the system. Um, so the, the benefits of that are, are just now, you know, this year starting to be felt and, and significantly helping overall. Uh, training time and resources is something that we, we are always uh, battling on, um, something that we're gonna, we learned with construction as a whole um, is flexibility. So with trainings, we're, we're working to be flexible as well, but at the same time, we got to consider our resources and, and, you know, the bottom line is if we give you enough time to plan ahead for this training, and if we're, we're making the training worth your time, then we're hoping that you should get in it. Uh, but that still leads to some other challenges as well. So all these things we've, we've been trying to keep in mind, you know, starting up as we go through our early teams, but when I first started, which was in 2020, right? Kind of at the end of all this, right? When we were ready to get up and running, uh, we had one team, one department that was kind of struggling, was stuck in the mud um, and nothing seemed to be working. Um, so that was our EMC construction team. Uh, they, they go out in the you know, construction job sites, they have plumbing, they have sheet metal, um, all kinds of things like that. Uh, so, Precursor to that, before I came on, Bob, as well as some of the other executive team from that first slide, actually attended a Shingo uh, Institute company tour in Utah. Uh, they had a lot of good things to say about that, but basically while, while they were there, they got to tour many different companies with improvement uh, processes in there and see just how many different ways and styles that you could have a continuous improvement program. Um, so the key takeaway there was, you know, there's not one single method for improvement. And, and as a company, as an organization, we can go beyond the idea driven organization, we can create whatever we need to create. So we took that we took those lessons that was kind of brought to me, you know, once I got started and involved, um, and, and we put it to the test with construction. Uh, this group, we tried to roll out the standard idea network procedure to them. Um, and it kind of fell on its face, to be quite honest. Uh, you know, just thinking about that role a little bit more, thinking about that discipline, they're out in the field. The problems that they experience aren't going to be the same problems two days from now. They need quick, rapid responses the same day so that they can react and get what they need to do done. So we realized that we had to change. We had to make some changes to our process. We had to tailor it to them. Um, so, you know, in that realization and that root cause analysis activity that we were doing, um, a couple other things we identified was, you know, putting a lot of faith in the managers. Um, early on, we decided when we were going to take another crack at this, when we wanted to try to customize a, a process for the construction group. The first decision we made was to involve everybody from the ground up. Um, this was a new beast that we were working with, very different from a lot of our other departments. So we wanted to get as many people with as much expertise in the field as possible. Furthermore, they're going to be the ones using it and sustaining it. So they have to understand. 
Um, so when I say not giving managers enough training, um, including them in the design, they need to be first and foremost, the ones, the, the advocates for this program. Everybody comes to them for questions uh, before they come to us. So the manager needs to be savvy and aware of what's going on. Um, also that weekly meeting structure was, was pushed back to a daily structure. So instead of spending an hour, one day a week, they actually spend sh short portions of time every day of the week so that they can identify opportunities together, work through them when they can, and then escalate them to the next level if they need to. Finally, uh, one of the major things that we, have, we discovered just from talking to some of the guys out there, you know, spending some time out on the, on the job site, uh, expectations were, were really not made clear. Um, as much as we tried to involve everybody from the start, they still got the idea that we had all these tremendous expectations that every single person had to find an opportunity every single day. Um, and that was very intimidating from them and honestly kind of discouraging. So we, we took some time, we, we are still taking time to make sure that we're clarifying and clear with our expectations and that going back to our vision statement, that's all we need to do to win. So as Bob mentioned earlier, you know, we just need to say, as long as you're trying to, to identify improvements or working on a solution, just shooting for the best solution. That's, that's what you're going to be doing to succeed. Um, so that really helped turn it around a lot in that group. Uh, and that's been, that's been helping with the morale overall. Um, but another thing that I can't neglect to mention is, is the Kinexus platform that actually rolled out right around that same time. Uh, Kinexus itself was a huge tool to unify us all, that group especially, uh, uh, into the rest of the IDEA network through the communication, the storage of the data. Um, and honestly, having such great help from Brianna Huddock, Elise Landrum, uh, and the whole Kinexus team has been huge when we were designing this new custom process. So definitely shout out to them, kudos to them for, for helping us keep the, the software up with these new changes we are making. Um, that last point there, training, 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 something that we are gonna get into more and more. Um, I think with continuous improvement, that makes a lot of sense. We should never stop training because um, that is the basis of what we're trying to do. Empower our employees so that they can make decisions for themselves and identify and work through problems so that the ones that management doesn't know about, they don't need to know about. And even the ones that they do know about, they, they get solved anyways. Um, I'm not trying to take management out, but we're trying to empower more people to do more things so that as a whole, we grow together and we just consistently reinforce our strengths. One of our biggest aha moments, just real quick, Evan, is one of our project managers, when we first did the first, the first round, it didn't work so well. He was the actual project manager on that. And when we did the training, he literally says, if I just known what we were trying to do, and became actually a champion for it. But that whole getting management involved early um, and, and really training them up to have them supportive is important. I can't stress that. It's an aha moment for us. Absolutely. So moving forward, you know, as, as we roll out new teams in the IDEA network, we're kind of getting to the last of our teams here, the last of our departments that need it. Um, but that is, those are things, lessons that we are applying to these new teams in the future, as well as any other new initiatives that we roll out in the IDEA network. Having everybody involved from the start, making sure that they know what our goals are, clearly communicating what we're trying to do, um, and then involving them along the way, letting them ask questions, letting them be part of the internal improvement of our system. Um, because, you know, the thing I say the most is we are continuous improvement. That's what we're trying to do. So if you have suggestions and feedback for us, that makes my job easier. You're telling me how to make it easier on you, and that's my ultimate goal. So we're applying these practices uh, in all different areas. Construction was a really good uh, example for us because it, it taught us a lot, um, and it fell right in line with uh, what we found out in Shingo. Um, so definitely uh, excited about that. Uh, do I need to keep going, Mark, with lessons learned? or? Yeah, if you don't, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, so, uh, like I said, we learned a lot from the construction process that we're now kind of applying to, to every new initiative that we start in, uh, today. Um, so basically, to list those off again, the manager plays in a, a crucial role in the early development and, and really ongoing uh, 
upkeep of an idea team of a continuous improvement culture as a whole. Um, particularly in that area, we were, we were combating a really uh, old culture, I will say, a long established culture. Um, and we're kind of trying to flip it on its head. So having the manager as that first line of defense on our side, um, really encouraging their team members has been tremendous. Um, the facilitator, uh, I've started talking about the hierarchy of the idea team a little bit, but that facilitator is our anchor point, something that we need to filter our training and expertise through. Um, the structure of the idea teams that we've kind of created makes it so that the facilitator serves a specific amount of time in order to gain the, the skills and expertise that they need to be successful. Um, from that point, we encourage teams to rotate roles inside the team and even rotate department members and team members on and off so that we can continue to bring everybody up together um, and, and make sure that we're training all of our people. But having the facilitator as, a, as an anchor point at all times kind of makes our capacity for training a little bit more feasible so that we can try to funnel our lessons through them. Um, everybody is eventually going to be a facilitator, so they will get the main training. But as we train the facilitators um, throughout the, the course of the year, uh, lessons get cascaded down through the team. Um, establishing and communicating clear expectations for all roles, that comes with involving everybody from the start. Uh, like Bob mentioned in the example you know, of that project leader, a project manager that became a, a leader for us, um, you know, if, if they know what we're trying to do, then they can try to help get us there. Um, and that's the benefit of, of the hundred headed brain. You know, as long as everybody is clear on the goals, we can come together and put our collective knowledge together. Um, that personal connection as technology becomes more and more prominent today with, you know, we mentioned Kinexus, but all kinds of stuff happening today. You know, we need to make sure that we, we maintain that personal connection. Um, that goes into the blameless culture that we've talked about. You know, making sure that we can have uh, conversations with our partners, with our team members, with our peers, with other teams and other areas of the company, um, so that when we approach them with an uh, opportunity that we have found that may involve their areas, it's taken in the right light, in a constructive and educational light, rather than a blaming and offensive way. Uh, so that personal connection, you know, making sure that we can have this conversation and we can really clarify what we mean to say is big. Uh, we call it the secret sauce of the idea network. Uh, COVID has really, you know, hurt that for us, but as, as you know, we're making changes as the world's returning back to normal, um, we're getting more, we're getting back to our secret sauce and we're really excited about that. Finally, you know, just more towards that secret sauce. Everybody's got to be open, encouraging of team members. And that starts with the manager and facilitators, those leadership roles. Um, so we're putting a lot of emphasis towards manager training moving forward, as well as that facilitator training. Um, and we are encouraging teams to rotate a little bit more often now since we've got a regular schedule again, now that COVID's kind of behind us for the most part. Um, so next steps, you know, kind of what we're talking about here, uh, continuing to build out the resources and training in Kinexus. Again, just to mention Kinexus one more time, uh, having that available for everybody, a central point where anybody can log in at once and, and work through the things that they need to do has been tremendous for us. And furthermore, we're actually building out training resources so that uh, instead of live sessions that, uh, that we have to give, you know, every single team member, we can do some of that as, as action item assignments towards the idea network to where individuals can go through some of the basics by themselves and then come to us with a base of knowledge to, to work with, as well as some early questions that we can help them out with. Um, idea activator, that's Alan Robinson training, something that he gave us when he, uh, when he was helping us roll out a couple of years ago. Um, and that's for what he prepared us for when early teams kind of run out of those low hanging fruit opportunities. Um, it's kind of that next wave of problem solving training that we're gonna be delivering. Um, Six Sigma training is something we're gonna be doing internally. We've got a couple of uh, sort of Six Sigma certified individuals here. Um, and really all we're shooting for there is to, to get people up to a white and yellow belt level. So below the green belt still, uh, but we figure it's very a positive experience overall just to get exposure to some level of Lean Six Sigma in some way. 
Um, and beyond that, we've actually uh, got some plans to, to encourage further education in the Six Sigma field to go obtain your, your green belt and your black belt and even further. Um, we've actually had two employees so far get all the way up to the black belt level. So it's very exciting uh, news there. Um, monthly workshops are, are, are going to be something we start up here as we get more and more uh, facilitators graduating to our mentor role, our training role. Um, once you get experienced in a, in a subject, then we want to, you know, if, if you're up for it, we want to be able to take advantage of that and, and share you with other people, with other departments. Um, so we've got that mentor role set up to where you can support another idea team, you can lead training, all kinds of stuff like that. And that really helps take some of the load off of the, the immediate uh, idea network directors uh, in terms of training. And finally, like we mentioned, new teams coming on board, encouraging the rotations and that so that we can get everybody in that facilitator role and get more mentors in the system so that overall we're helping each other constantly. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mark. Uh, I know we're ready for some announcements and then some Q&A. So first off, we've got a question. I know you've mentioned training and development, but this will, I think, build upon what you've said. How do you differentiate between training and development? How do you measure the effectiveness of your training program? Evan or Bob, do you have some thoughts on that? I honestly just, I, I can only be honest. I don't really differentiate between the two. Um, I would say that, um, you know, there's an old saying, uh, what if we train them and they leave us and what if we don't train them and they stay with us? Right. So to me, a lot of it is, is, uh, enabling people to, to be able to perform at a higher level. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't differentiate as far as, um, and Evan might have something different on that. That's the beauty of having generations, but. I would say that um, a lot of what we got into with, uh, with we focused on time saving. So I'm going to kind of frequent a little bit of how do we measure success. We didn't get into a strict ROI model and I'm a finance guy, um, but we didn't. Um, a lot of what our focus was, was time savings. And so we look at, you know, investing time in finding ideas and coming up with solutions. And then how much time am I saving in productivity from those efforts and the cumulative impact of productivity and how that builds upon itself. So that, that's my answer. I'm going to open it up for Evan. Yeah, I, I would say I, I agree with Bob. If I was kind of forced to differentiate between the two, I would say a large portion of our process up until this point has been training, you know, teaching people how to do the basic expectations of the, of the process, you know, of the program. How do we have an idea meeting, things like that. Whereas now, you know, some of the things, all the trainings that I've mentioned that we've got scheduled for the next six months to a year, that's more of the development side. You know, we're building on the skills that we've trained, you know, that we've trained out, that uh, we've started to learn. Now we need to develop those. Um, <clears throat> and that I think certifications, now that I've thought about it, maybe the certifications or development more down the pipeline of it, but yeah. Yeah, I just did. Um, and measuring the effectiveness of those, I would say uh, the results of the surveys, you know, come into play with that, as well as the, you know, observations from around the idea network. Um, one, one major thing that we've got going on is, you know, as different managers and different support team members observe idea teams, they come back to the group with opportunities that they observe. Um, and through those opportunities, we can truly see if some of the things that we've worked on in the past are, are coming back to light again. Well, also, That's real quick on the training in relation to the network, I just, sorry, I wasn't in the moment on that question, but I would say that um, we do maintain the, the participation and implemented OFI numbers. That is one of the things that we do track to see if someone needs training or needs someone to come in and help. We do actually kind of track team performance. It's not a race. It's just more, is this team getting OFIs completed? Uh, do they have things that are, you know, in, in limbo? So we, I guess from a ground level training, are, we see training requirements based on those issues. So. Yeah, Sorry. to point to, to what you said earlier, Bob, we've, we've basically been trying to get everybody comfortable with the process, um, not so much worried about, you know, the financial impacts, um, but with this, you know, 
development part, I guess, the focus on development now, we're, we're going to start introducing that in and, and putting more focus onto it. Okay, we have another question that asks, uh, do you collaborate across teams to identify ideas and teams run out of ideas? So maybe first off there, there's an assertion. I'm curious what you think. Do teams ever run out of ideas? And if so, or in addition to what they're doing within the team, how do you collaborate, collaborate across teams? I think there's two questions there in a way. Uh, so I'll start with this. And Bob, I know you've got stuff to say as well, but um, teams always run out of ideas. Uh, anytime you, you go and ask a team why they haven't had, you know, uh, an implemented idea in the past month, you know, we, we don't have any. We can't come up with any OPs. Um, but, you know, that's that's something that we, we are used to hearing and we're used to responding to. Um, Kinexus, we've got our replicable ideas bank that we encourage everybody to use. Um, and if you see that, then we encourage you to have that conversation with the other team. So not only when your OFI or your opportunity involves another team member and it's in process in theirs, but if you're trying to replicate a solution that they've already implemented, you can reach out to them and, and have that conversation. Um, so yeah, I, I would say, yes, we collaborate across teams, um, especially when they run out of ideas. I think alongside that, the replicable ideas, the first thing that we suggest for them to do is go observe another idea team meeting. Just see how they do things, see what they talk about, see what it inspires in you. And I, I would say I always consider ideas are like a well. It may run dry every once in a while, but the rain's going to come and it'll refill itself. And so some of the stuff you talk about is uh, problem sensitivity. Um, uh, uh, again, depending on how busy you are or what's going on, that could cause an issue. One thing we did this year with uh, when COVID came out, we tried to use the idea network. We said, hey, put your other ideas in the parking lot for now and let's actually focus on things that will get us through all the changes that are coming related to COVID. Um, so anytime there's a change in environment, a new software, there's ample opportunity for improvement. It's just uh, people having line of sight to it and uh, you know being able to maintain it. Um, when they're busy, that's been our biggest struggle. It's like, no, get the ideas down. If you don't have time to put as much into working them, we understand, but get those things down so you can work on them later. And one thing on cross-departmental, we, we definitely try to share replicable ideas. We tell our people to go to other meetings. Uh, if you're struggling to come up with ideas, your action item this week can go, go attend another idea team meeting because they can inspire you. Oh, we have something similar to that. So do those actions. And then a, another side note, um, one thing with cross-departmental, the, the speed, once you start to do cross-departmental, um, I guess, collaboration, it tends to slow things down a bit. It's hard to schedule. It's hard to get people organized. And we have been trying to focus on how to make that a more systematic process and like more defined to make it easier for people to accomplish what they want to accomplish. But um we do encourage it and it's it's helped a lot of people who never talked before in the company discuss things that will make the company better and i think that's great okay. um, we've got a couple of questions about metrics the first one here asks in building an improvement culture we need to see that our efforts matter and pay off how and when do you incorporate metrics into the problem solving process and how do you follow them up? Yeah, so like Bob said from one of the previous questions, uh, for the longest time in the, in, in the development of the idea network, we've really been focusing on, you know, do we understand the core process? Are we meeting the basic expectations um, so that we can then get to a point where developing our skills further and, and just building on the base that we've built? Um, so I can say this year, uh, we've gotten to a point, thanks, thanks in large part to Kinexus to, to give you guys credit again, um, and, and Bob for putting so much effort into getting all the data into Kinexus. I know that was a, a humongous task, um, oh. but we've been able to produce the, uh, some key metrics that we now share with our managers as well as our facilitators. Um, and kind of the, the summary page, the first page of, that you see, that managers see, um, shows you know, the top performing teams as well as the teams showing at the bottom of the report. Um, and we're very careful about our, our 
uh, wording or phrasing with that because just because you're at the bottom of the report doesn't mean that you're not meeting expectations or mean, doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. Um, so along with the introduction of the KPIs into the, the, the process, um, we've included some training for our managers as well. Um, within the numbers, you know, when we see this, we don't wanna immediately jump to conclusions and, and try to go to your idea team, have that conversation and figure out what's going on. Um, because it's always a matter of what's going on. It's, it's very rarely a matter of they're just not doing it. Um, so having that expectation from the start has really helped. Bob, anything to add there? Yeah, I would say, well, one, I want to give a shout out to Noah for the data getting in the system because he was a champ um, and I appreciate it. But secondly, um, the number of active participants on a team can also be a little misleading um, when it comes to where we've talked about doing some metrics that are like per individual, like this per employee for implemented ideas or completed tasks. But I think also you just, we have some teams that have 13 members. We have some teams that have three. So they're obviously, when you look at them on the same reporting, it's not going to be apples to apples, but I think you, you want to, kind of keep it where people can be competitive, but it's not a numbers game, if that makes any sense. You want people to stay motivated. And you're doing a lot with recognition too, Evan, as well, right? Yeah, we actually just introduced the recognition program where it's kind of like, a you know, as you make contributions to the Idea Network, you earn some reward points that can be uh, redeemed for a couple of cool items. You know, I got a hat back there with the Idea Network symbol on it. Um, logos, you know, branded items for all the companies in conjunction with the idea network. So nothing too crazy, nothing, you know, out of, out of, you know, normal expectations, but just something to help show people that, you know, we, we care that what you do um, and we're acknowledging it um, because with that, with those points and with the, you know, sending the, the reward items or, you know, maintaining that it by default gives us that, further vision, it, it puts our eyes on the successes that they're having so that we can recognize it further. Um, and, you know, beyond the points, we've got a couple different platforms internally that we use to share successes from around the organization and encourage uh, further collaboration with different teams. Um, so that, thanks for bringing that up, Bob. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, I was also doing that a little bit because I thought we might have lost Mark for a second. So I wanted to. Okay. Oh, no. No, I'm we, sorry. I just, I turned off my camera. It's just my internet is, my, my, can you hear me? We can hear you. I feel like, I feel like Max from Quantum Leap over here. I feel like I'm going to disappear any moment with this background. Yeah. yeah um, I, thank you for the internet, but we hate the internet at the same time. Um, so if this isn't working, I might ask that maybe, maybe we can do a follow-up session and record some q a if if this isn't working but there was another follow-up question on K, um, metrics are there what kpis do you use to track your improvement system is there any sort of pulse check metric i mean are you tracking number of improvements percentage completed how long is it taking to complete them um right now one of the major ones that we uh, track is completed improvements and how long it's been since your last completed improvement um We've uh, kind of built that out more as of the past couple months to track <clears throat> complete, excuse me, completed action items or tasks, as well as submitted OFIs. Um, and Bob kind of mentioned the varying team counts and, and levels of experience within the teams. Uh, so we try to, if, if we ever do compare teams, you know, team to team per se, uh, we try to keep it at a ratio of, of number per idea team member. Um, and that's something that, you know, we really put a lot of our focus on when creating the, the, the framework for the recognition program, because, you know, when we're rewarding people for the work that they do, uh, we want to continue with our culture, with our underlying uh, belief that everybody can be involved and everybody should be involved. Um, we didn't want to exclude people who weren't on the idea team at the time. Um, so we need to stay uh, wary of that. Um, so Basically, I guess that kind of created the difference between uh, completed OFIs and action items are really measured by active idea team members, and then created OFIs are measured by total members of the department, if that makes sense. Um, but in the training portion, 
pre-development portion, uh, that's kind of been the, the metrics that we've used to focus on uh, what we need to improve on. I'm sorry that this is bad and this might be bad for the audience. So let's go ahead and wrap up and maybe we can record a separate Q&A session when my internet is cooperating and we can push that out to people as um, a recording. So um, I apologize for those problems. This is how it goes sometimes in our virtual world. So I'm trying not to be too upset about that um, internet issue. But I, I do want to thank Evan and Bob um, for presenting today and um, really appreciate everyone for being here and look forward to and hope everyone will come back for the webinar series that we're going to be doing in May. So Evan, Bob, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah absolutely.